Okay, it's six o'clock. This is a meeting of the Lummis to School Committee. It is Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. We are here at the Emergency Management Building. And um, I would ask that you all stand and join me in the salute. This the meeting flag. is being recorded. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. So that we could accommodate everyone, we made it optional for school committee members to either attend in person or on Zoom. But at this time, I'd like to start from the front and allow each of the committee members to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Mr. Perla. Uh, good evening, Councilor Carlos, uh, at large. Greg Thomas, School Committee, Ward 3. Josh Salger, School Committee, Ward 4. Robin, at large school committee member. Melissa Bible, at large school committee member. Greg Renskowski, Ward 1. Okay. And Dean Mazzarella, mayor for the city. All right. We'll now <clears throat> ask if there's anyone that would like to participate in public comment. First, we'll ask if there's anyone present. Please speak to matters on the agenda. If you don't have a copy of the agenda, we can get you one. Um, public forum. And then also, Chris, if there's anybody that submitted anything in writing to be entered into the public record. And if there's anybody that's on standby, um, also let us know of their status. So we'll ask anyone that's present who would like to address the school committee, please so. That, that computer is muted, so we have to unmute that computer. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Carrie Noseworthy. I live at 95 Smith Street. Um, since the start of COVID, our family was touched by three deaths in three weeks lost a family member to suicide during the first summer and were unable to properly grieve or support each other. And my old son has been disabled for about a year due to contracting COVID pre-vaccine at work. My tolerance for the discourse that argues science and minimizes the collective suffering of others is at the same place as most other community members that's non-existent. Many in Lemonster are apathetic to voting or engagement because they feel their voices won't be heard, but they should be heard. Pediatric mental health was in crisis before COVID. Many of you here have seen me speaking for about, I don't know, 12 or 13 years now about special education and mental health. Special education outcomes are nowhere near regular education outcomes. And our budget was in the best of fifth percentile statewide before COVID and COVID money is not sustainable funding. Teachers were leaving our district for higher paying jobs elsewhere. Lemonster deserves quality education. Lemonster teacher staff to include our nurse deserve support so they can be successful. We need to take students and staff in our collective arms and address their mental health inside and outside the classroom. There are over 6,000 students, their families, in addition to all staff and their families, this body is beholden to. Lemonster deserves leadership who holds themselves to a higher standard and are ready to roll up their sleeves and do the work that needs to be done and not be a pawn in a nationwide right wing con to remove masks and cause chaos. Students, staff and residents are suffering. Please know your audience, which is all of us and not just certain individuals. Excuse me, could you go speak about the mask? 
Nope. My name is Wendy Anderson. I live at 21 Green Street in Lemonster. My son Joshua will be speaking to you in a moment. And what he's going to share with you has both broken my heart and my faith in this body to act in the best interest of our students. But what I'd like to share with you is really for those of you who are new. I used to sit on your side of the table and I learned on day one that the role of the committee is very limited. I hope you all can learn that quickly and be guided by serving the best interests of our students and teachers and not any personal ambition you may hold. Just as when I sat in your seat, I could push any what might be called a liberal agenda. You must all leave any kind of right wing or Trumpian agendas outside of this door and work in the best interest of all students and teachers in our district. Keep in mind anything you vote to do that violates any rules, laws, or from DESE, the state, or the federal government will cost our district funding. And we all know that that money will not be made up elsewhere. So I hope you all do the right thing by all students and teachers. Thanks. Um, hello, my name is Joshua Anderson, uh, 21 Green Street. I'm here today to speak in support of mask mandates for schools and doing everything in our power to get the students of Lemons to vaccinated. I am unsettled and alarmed when I hear anyone suggestion, suggesting moving masks to schools. I know I live in a country where even the most basic of science can be doubted and rejected by maniacal conspiracy theory, so I, I should be used to it, but it never fails to break my heart to see the complete disregard people in power have for my friends and family. I have lost faith in the education system that was made to prepare me for the future. A few of the people on the council have known me for a majority of my life. You know the high regard I hold for schools and the people who are trying their best to improve them. But uh, I'll be honest, that was one decision away from this speech being about why I'm dropping out and never stepping foot in a school again. As my friends and loved ones are repeatedly the victims of other people's negligence, I can't help but look up and see the school systems that were sworn to protect us, giving all the support of a building being hollowed before it's demolished. One of my best friends had to quarantine over the past week and thus is wildly unprepared and terrified about the very important test coming up this week. The truth is the system has failed at every level. The students are being treated as expendable, the teachers are overworked, dehumanized, underpaid, and no one is doing anything. I am beyond baffled. It's not entirely the police's fault. Obviously, there have been failings at every level of government, but the greatest changes, along with the worst disasters, happen right here at the city level. Science matters, and all the science comes to one thing. We need to mask up, we need to get back to it, and we need to stop letting like, idiocy and conspiracy nonsense overtake the world of science. That's all. Chris, is there anybody else that's um, online waiting to? Let me just remind everybody. Chris, could you get everybody a cup? I think we're speaking to issues that are not on the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to speak to um, an agenda item tonight? Because what's on the agenda tonight doesn't sound like what people are speaking to at the public forum. So if there's somebody who would like to speak on any of the items that are on the agenda, I think we have some. Oh, back. yes, the can is open here, I guess. The uh, toothpaste is open, so we're going to allow two minutes from everyone. But in further meetings, we'll put the agenda out in advance. And um, anyone that wishes to comment on items that are, appear before the school committee um, will be allowed to speak. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, Nikki Turpin from Jocelyn Street in Lemonster. Um, Everyone can hear me. I'm sure that you can probably hear that I can project. Okay, great. So the mask mandate has been extended, but I would like it to be on the record that some people wanted to challenge a choice that is best for the community. I'm not in personal attendance, so that was first going to be my choice. Then I said, even though I'm an educator, even though I'm a parent, and I know that the that risk is 180 students that I am in care of. 65 faculty and staff that I am in care of, as well as my own child and her ability to access the education that we try to give her within the limits of public schools. It's important that I show up. So I wanna make sure that everyone understands that I vaccinated myself for me, but I'm wearing this mask for you. And I am sorry 
that you sit next to people who don't have empathy within their hearts to care about your safety. I'm not, am I sure? Really cool. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. I want you to call out brazen and sneaky placement of this topic for the end of this meeting as new business. Is this what we should expect from a school committee to consistently work in the shadow? I digress, I'm gonna go back. The idea of a responsibility to a larger community. As I look at what presents as white passing, human beings in front of me, I don't know if you actually grasp the idea that this virus affects students of color and their families at a higher rate. Are you of Latino descent? Are you a person of color? Then you are white passing ability because I don't know what your background is. You could sit there and be Latino and look white. So again, excuse me? Go ahead. No, they're not, yeah, up. Go ahead. I'm not done. Someone spilled to me. So my time, I'm taking my time back on this one. Just go ahead. You're, you're speaking, we're listening. Thank you. I have a question. Some here have thought about the impact of students, I imagine. But have you actually thought about that from your students of color? The limits of public school percentage of students of color is greater than your students of, of white presenting ability. So, so what, what does that mean for them? I see Facebook posts from a school committee member asking when was the last time my child made a friend? Guess what, every day, because she's an empathetic human being and she's a kind human being. And that is not hidden by a mask. Those are her words. Her wearing her mask actually shows how good of a friend she can be. What's a birthday party? That's another question I was asked by a school committee member. What does it matter if you have a birthday party if the people that you want to be there can't be there because they're too sick? Frankly, those examples and excuses were selfish and show a lack of empathy and playing education when it comes to understanding the needs of all children and their educators. Increased stress will create a greater testing and financial burden on a system that clearly has already shown it's not capable of supporting the needs of its students. I can say that my child's access to education is the pride of my life because I am an educator as is her father. But to pull away her ability to access it in a safe environment because of some type of political subjugation is absolutely disgusting and I expect better from this community. Thank you. Chris, any other speakers? And let me remind everyone who might be watching we set this up today, so it's optional. So if you wanted to wear a mask, you could. They're a fresh mask. I would suggest that anybody wearing a mask, if it's more than a day old, it's not effective. Please replace it if you're gonna be here. And we left it open so people could maintain their six foot distance inside the room. We made it optional for people to be able to come to the meeting if they wanted, but if they wanted to appear in person, again, we left it. The room is wide open so that people could access their six foot um, distance. Was anybody else that wanted to speak? Yes. All right. Let's try to keep it to two minutes so we can get back to the um, the agenda, please. Can I, can I also ask, we not have the back and forth to if someone wants to speak, they can speak, but we don't All right, through the chair. Comments are going to be made from the members through the chair. And that's the best way. So noted. Sir, you have two minutes. We and, really need to, real quick, we team. made a commitment to stick to, to the agenda items and to keep them so that we could, um, I guess, bring everybody up to speed as to the issues in the schools. And so go ahead, you have two minutes. All right, um, I'm not gonna be political, I'm not gonna say what's the right, I'm going to say what's in my heart. Um, I have, my name is Philip, I am a Lemesa resident. I would like to read this um, uh, testimony from a friend of mine who is currently at Lemonster High School as a student. This was written in the fall of last year. Attending in-person schooling during the 2020-21 school year had many problematic restrictions, but one of the most outstanding issues was requiring masking during the school day, as well as after-school activities. Not only was it not only was it fruitless to enforce, but it physically restricted students and impaired their learning experience. 
Reflecting on my few weeks of in-person learning, I noticed a clear decline in my stamina and breathing capabilities. Simple tasks such as getting up the stairs became difficult due to restricted airflow. The school said there would be a block of time for students to unmask, but that was nowhere near enough time to recover. And many students would remove their masks throughout the day to get by. It came to a point where the persistent reinforcement of masking policy inspired students to find creative ways of removing their masks, if only for a few moments. If a policy is restricting students to the point of creative rebellion, then clearly there is a need to change. The COVID restrictions made it increasingly difficult on the teachers when trying to seat students in the classroom as it became a game of chess. Students were required to keep their distance and were not permitted to face each other, even with masks, yet they need to make they need to make contact and share supplies in order to complete assignments. So not only was contact already required in the classroom, which would theoretically share more bacteria than breathing the same unfiltered air, but students also made contact throughout the day as they communicate with friends and partners. I recently went to the January 3rd inauguration of Dean Mazzarella and his other friends. I took photographs of Governor Baker, Dean Mazzarella, Superintendent Deacon, and other authorities taking pictures with their masks cloth and then putting the mask back on. This is Kabuki theater politics for a $20 million check from the federal government. I will not be a proud citizen of Lemonster while our school committee sits idly by while students get this, this sham of an academic institution. The principal of Lemonster schools just said the other day, I a student overheard him say to, in a faculty meeting, Oh, don't worry about the midterm exams. We, we're not worried about how they go because if stu students do a tough time on them, then, then we'll, we'll look over there how they do. This is unacceptable. This is disgusting. This is treasonous. And this is absolutely criminal. Anyone who is responsible right, for the masking of children, you're, you're will I will, we will all remember you. All right. Two minutes is up. Thank you. All right. Would anyone else like to address the school committee? Anyone else like to address the school committee? If not, we'll close this portion of the meeting. We're gonna move now on to communications. Are there any communications? There appear not to be any communications. We'll now move on to presentations and discussions. And um, let me just, in the meantime, we're gonna do the, the um, I'll pass out the committee assignments. If there's somebody that wants to add their name, there are some that there are only two people assigned to. And I think I've, Pretty much added everybody into the equation in terms, excuse me, in terms of what you requested. But if there's a committee that looks like it's a little low and short on um, members, then feel free um, to send me an email, and we'll try to balance them out. I know there was quite a few requests for some of the committees. The entire com committee will be the committee on finance. I think it's important that we all get the same information at the same time. They take a little long, but I think it's critical. So tonight we'll start with Melanie Mikes and Lauren Sapola. What I'd asked is to sort of do a general overview. We have four new members of the school committee and I wanted to bring everybody up to speed as to uh, the federal funding that the, the city school department received, how we've spent uh, the CARES Act money and also the American Rescue Plan money, if we've spent it, where we've spent it, and what are our plans to spend? And if you could do a general overview of what the balances are at this particular point, that would be helpful as well. So I will turn the, the uh, attention over to Melanie and Lauren Sapola. Sure, thank you, Dean. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome new members. Um, if you refer to the packet that you were given, mm -hmm. You'll see that we have included what we call the standard financial reports. Um, these are reports that we give on a monthly basis, and um, we've decided obviously to continue using them unless otherwise instructed. Um, if you refer to the packet, you'll see that the transactions for the general fund expenses and general fund salaries are listed uh, two pages. The transactions are what's posted through January 12th, 2022. Um, the Lemister Public Schools have expended and encumbered, or what we call committed, funds up to $24,105,480.37 in the general fund expenses and $51,573,043.68 
in the general fund salaries line for a total of $75,678,524.05. In the general fund expense section, normally what I will do is I will review uh, anything that I feel is of importance or may stand out to the committee and try to um, explain that for you. Um, We continue to watch the line, which is listed as DESE code 5200, Uh, insurance programs. To this time, we've gotten our first and second quarter bills. Um, Both bills have come in lower than our projected budgeted amount. Um, As of January 12th, you can see that our balance is a negative $1,159,237. That is something that we had uh, projected and we knew uh, at the beginning of the school year. So we already had, uh, and I'll review this just for everybody's uh, new on the committee, but we had already made a commitment to use the prior year fiscal 21 um, school choice carry forward money to cover that balance. Um, There is enough money carried forward from fiscal 21 that it will more than cover that balance. Um, So that is our projected plan at this time. Um, also, line 3510 is the athletics. Ellie, um, so sure. can I just ask, just, so at what rate are we spending on the insurance? I'm sorry, at what rate? At what rate? So are we where you projected us to be at this time of the year? Well, the first and second quarter bills have come in less than we projected, but that makes sense to me because we are not able to, Uh, we haven't been able the first two quarters to hire all of those posted FTEs that we had projected in the budget. So it makes sense to me. So you might at the end of the year, if this, if you're spending at this rate, you may have some money to transfer into other places. Absolutely. That you typically would have used. Absolutely. If, If we're able to reduce that negative balance as the quarters go on, then it would be something where we could continue to leave that money carrying forward from school choice in the bucket of revenue that we have. So maybe you can highlight uh, um, in terms of the percentages that were at the rate that we're spending, Mm -hmm. any areas that we're running short on, any areas that we're um, running not a surplus, but not spending at the rate projected. Maybe that's the best way to highlight the areas of the budget. Sure, sure. I had kind of high, wanted to highlight those negatives first because of course yeah. everybody wants to know why there's a negative balance, um, but I can certainly point out a few others. Sure. Um, so the athletics, um, you can see has a negative balance, $80,578. Um, just a little pitch for the high school here, but if you haven't been able to get up to the high school and see the updates to the gymnasium, it is well worth a visit. Um, There are new basketball hoops that run on Wi-Fi, so no longer does the custodian need to risk life and limb and climb a ladder and hand crank the hoops. (laughs) Um, The floors have been refinished, the the painting's been redone, there's new wall pads, new batting cages, Um, long overdue project, but um, it's worth worth a a look-see if you can get up to see it. Um, The plan is as you were saying, Dean, there are gonna be some savings in our utility line, utility services. Um, We have some absorbent amount of um, credits from solar credits that are being carried forward from previous year that we did not realize we would have. So that's one line where we will grab from in order to cover the athletics um, overage. But as you were saying, to point out, that's another line that we will have some savings on that we could reclassified to cover another project or expense that we have. Um, mm-hmm. Currently, we're looking at, uh, if you look at 9,300, 9,400, which is our tuition line, those lines typically, um, we use those lines up pretty quickly in the general fund, and then we move on to our circuit breaker funding. And you'll see that when you look at the revolving uh, account that at this point in time, we are going to move into using the carry forward that we've had from fiscal 21 for our tuitions. Um, We had planned on 2 million uh, in our budget, but it's potential that we could go over that. We are certainly seeing the needs for our students grow um, as the days go on. So 
Um, really, at this time, we've got about 1.2 million left in expenses. And I know to most people that sounds like a lot of money, um, but it's really, it's not. And we're only halfway through the year. So, you know, there's these unexpected things that are coming down the pipeline. Um, just over the weekend, we had Fallbrook School had a pipe burst. Um, so those are things that we're going to have to fix and it's going to take some money. And, you know, those are things that are unexpected and you can't use all your encumbered money because obviously you need to be able to plan for that stuff too. Um, our salary line, which would be on the next page, um, you'll see the general fund salary section. Just a point, hiring and staffing under the current conditions um, just continue to be a challenge. Uh, a situation that schools across the country are really dealing with. Um, and it's affecting every department from our school lunch program all the way to the transportation staffing um, for the bus company. So just to keep that in mind, um, that even though we have some money left on the line, we are still trying to hire. And again, anybody who's looking for a job, <laughs> go right ahead and take a, take a look at our website because plenty of uh, positions there. <laughs> Um, but I want let's point out if you look at line 2330 for the salary budget, uh, that is what's called paraprofessionals, but that actually includes our paraprofessionals and our tutors. Um, Desi kind of combines them two under, under <coughs> 30. But you can see that the balance there is a negative $88,387. Um, right now, we are seeing a need for more pairs and tutors in the classroom. It's, it's, I believe that it's just becoming from the COVID, you know, being out of the classroom so long, these kids just need more one-on-one -on -one time. Um, so that's why we're over there. I don't see that we're going to have any issues covering that overage. Um, the bottom line, obviously, there's still $915,000 there. And there's a lot of money that because of being prorated when we hire new employees, those budgeted FTEs. A lot of those didn't get hired until after the first quarter and even some still the second quarter. So there are savings there that we will be able to use in order to cover the overages. Um, you know, great example, Dean, if you were mentioning lines that, you know, even though they're not negative, they're still affected. Um, you know, the custodians, we can't hire custodians and keep them. Mm -hmm. And so we've got some money left over there, not because we want it left over, um, but because we just can't hire. Uh, and it's been that way from day one. So there'll be a money left over there that we can disperse amongst um, the salary lines if we need to. There's also um, line 3200, which is the medical and health services, sort of a no brainer um, due to the high demand on our nursing staff. We did need to hire another additional nurse that was not in our budget, um, but obviously it was a need that we had to fill. So that too will also be covered. Probably in my, my perspective, it's going to look like the custodian line is gonna cover that with its uh, money that's left over. So again, just pointing out to any, any additional staff that we hire on that is not covered by the general fund mm -hmm. is certainly told up front that those positions, if they're granted, that they are grant positions. And if they're being paid from any grant that ends, certainly their position may end also with that grant. Um, but any positions that are in the general fund will also be reviewed during the budgeting process, which has already started um, for the next fiscal year. So fiscal 22, there will be a reclass of funds to cover that, but we will also be reviewing any new positions that we put in like the nurse that we didn't anticipate. Um, well, you could feasibly use some of the, and we'll talk about the American Rescue Plan, but Mm -hmm. You could feasibly, if you needed more paraprofessionals or school nurses or psychologists or whatever, it, That's correct. You know, put them on a three-year contract or a two-year contract Absolutely. And, and, and reach into that fund. So those areas shouldn't be right. over, you know, an area of over-concern. Yep, absolutely. Most of that is, um, I believe, and I'm sure Lorene will speak better to that, but um, most of that is SR3 that we do have some funding to cover some of that. Right. Um, I'm gonna move on. There's not too much else going on on the salary line right now. I am gonna move on to the revolving report, which is mm -hmm. that third page. Yep. Now, may I interrupt for one second? Can you just say what the bottom line is in general that we're on sure. the plus total? 
Absolutely. Our general fund total, um, you're talking the two added together? Yeah, yeah. two point one. Uh, yep, the general fund is left with um, re revenue of 2.1, which is $2,147,296. Currently, thank you. Okay, absolutely. So it's not uncommon for for any member, anybody watching, for us at the end of the year, to um, shift funds in a particular direction. So if something right now isn't, you know, we weren't able to fund something at the beginning of the you know the budget process, it's it's quite possible. So we need to be thinking of priorities as we go through the year. If mm -hmm. if there is in fact anything left over at the end of the year. It's right. always good to be putting mentally or keeping in private notes uh, some things that you think might need funding based on things you might hear from a PTO or a principal or a teacher or even the custodian on what where those funds might go. So it's yep. always good to have a list. We have a capital improvement plan, uh, but Me it's too. always good to have those things that you might hear about so that we can, um, so we're, we're, we're strategic about any funds that we have towards the end of the year. All right, you want to move to the revolving now? Absolutely. Right. Um, the revolving accounts, um, you can see that we've been pretty um, fortunate, I want to say, for the last uh, year and a half or two, that we've been able to hold on to some of our revolving funds and carry them forward, such as our circuit breaker, which we had mentioned um, our, uh, you know, a couple minutes ago, that we're carrying forward over $2 million in circuit breaker. And that's going to pay for another $2 million that we don't have to fund out of the general fund for this year. Um, at the end of this year, we are going to, uh, we're foreseeing that we can sh carry forward another $2.1 million. Uh, again, depends. We have students that have to go out of district. You know, even now we're seeing students that may have to go out of district and that can cost anywhere up to $300,000. So um, we're hoping that we'll be able to carry another 2.1 forward to fiscal 23, but we were gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to wait and see on that one. Um, all of our programs are doing really, really well. Um, I'm seeing that our lunch program, um, starting last year, they had a sizable revenue balance because we certainly are seeing with the free lunch program that the state reimbursement is pretty high. So, the Chartwells has been wonderful and they're actually going and updating all of our school lunches, uh, school lunch um, rooms, uh, the cafeterias and, you know, new paint goes a long way and new signs and they're looking for furniture to replace. So, you know, again, it's, it's something for the students to give back to the students in a time where they really need to see something that's, that's bright and, and brand new, I think. So they're doing a great job in, in spending down a little bit of that money just to do something back for the kids. They're also replacing a lot of equipment in the kitchens and um, you know they're just doing a great job with all that. Um, the West Boylston uh, money, which is called what we call the non-resident tuitions because right now it just includes West Boylston. It potentially could include um, other schools in the future. But right now um, we're up to about 31 students, Paula. 31. With 40 positions available. Right. And that right now is, you know, bringing in over um, $300,000 a year, which is also helping um, give back to the vocational program. So that's a, that's a positive on here also. But you can see the available balance projected for the, the school year of $7.1 million for our revolving accounts is certainly going to come, you know, come in handy if we need it. But if not, it'll also be a positive going into fiscal 23, because you just never know. Our years have been so crazy. Um, you know, we all thought we were going back to normal this year, but this is definitely a different normal to me. So um, the budgeting process looks a little different every year I do it in the last three years. Um, this year is no different, um, but it looks like we're doing pretty well here. And even our, our school choice, you know, if we don't have to use it, Mayor, you're correct. We could, you know, reclassify some of those salaries and certainly pay for some of that insurance and keep our school choice in place. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know that's a brief overview, but um, we can get in, you know, as the year evolves, as our meetings evolve, we can sort of explain a little more on like the Kendall Trust, which is a trust that Absolutely. somebody, a benefactor, left set aside for us. 
we can get into some of those. I just wanted to give a kind of a broad view on where we are right now as, as sure. we see here tonight. Also, Bill Brady is the uh, Ward 1 um, City Council member, and he's here this evening, and he's also uh, heads up the, uh, the Education Committee for the City Council. So uh, Bill has stayed in touch with me. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> now you, yeah, you were muted. Um, it, it definitely speaks well to your forecasting, Mel. Both of those accounts were we're on the positive side, and we're at the end of January, so this is this is great news for us. Um, we do have to do some careful planning to uh, finish out this school year. We do have five months left, and uh, we'll be moving forward as we start thinking about indicating where money needs to be allocated for the FY23. But you've done a tremendous job, and it's really not it's really nice not seeing a lot of negatives on these reports. So thank you. Thank you. So as I was saying, Bill Brady, I know there's a little bit of feedback, so I'll expect. I'll speak um, slower. <laughs> Bill Brady is Ward 1 City Councilor for the city. He's on the heads up the Education Committee for the City Council. He's been in touch with me since he first got elected on school issues, and he's here tonight as well. Were there any questions for Melody thus far? All right. Now, if we can move into CARES Act and the Mer American Rescue Plan. Dean, can I say something real quick? Uh, sure. Just to remind everyone to unmute themselves. So far, I've only heard Paula, Dean, and Melanie speak. I can't hear anyone else. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Laureen Cipolla, and I'm working very closely with Mel and with our city procurement officer, Greg Chapdelaine in the CARES grant and the ESSER grants. Um, they all fall under the, there's a lot of alphabet soup here, I'm sorry. They fall under the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Federal um, bucket of money. I use that term loosely, bucket. Um, so uh, I, I know that Mel has put together a, a slide or a, a sheet, um, an Excel sheet with all of the ESSER monies listed on that. I can display that or I can just speak to it, but it is in your packet and it falls directly <coughs> after the pages that Mel has been referring to. So I wanna thank Mel for putting them all on one page. There's a lot of information. Um, we have, believe me, a, a lot more um, documentation that we do need to keep track of as, uh, Mayor Mazzarella had asked, um, just a, an overview. There are three ESSER funding sources. The first one, ESSER 1, or they also call that the CARES Act, will run through September of 2022. So we have um, a, about a, three quarters <laughs> of a year to, to spend that money down. That was approximately $1.2 million. And we currently have approximately $300,000 of that left, of which a good portion is earmarked for teachers or during the, the instructional professional line. So it could be teacher guidance or psychologists, and also the end of the year fringe benefits that we are required to pay based on the federal rules. So that funding that we have left is is really for to finish out the year for some staffing that we have brought on based on the needs that we have from COVID and the educational programming that we need because of COVID. ESSER 2 is approximately $5 million. It was exactly uh, 4.990534. So approximately $5 million. Um, we have expended some of that and we have actually um, earmarked some for major purchases that we're working with Greg Chapdelaine on. So we do not, we have 
on the sheet that you see what has actually been expended. So what's gone onto a warrant, gone to city hall and a check has been cut for. But we do have large sums of that money that we are in the process of um, putting into place. And you'll see that as, it, as we go along. I would like to give a, a great shout out to Elliot Nado. He's our facilities manager and he has learned um, both state and federal procurement laws. He's been working with a number of our providers and our vendors. Um, Steve Mamoni, who is our digital learning um, administrator, has also been working very closely with Mel and with Greg Chapterlane to purchase both um, equipment for students, teachers, and other instructional staff, as well as a variety of projects that are infrastructure. And I'm sure Steve on another date would like to talk about those. I'm not going to speak to the technical side of the thing. Um, SR3. Can we, just, can we just hold right there for a second? Sure. All right. So where on this sheet is the CARES Act funding? I know you have a bunch of columns here, budget expended remaining, and you have the SR1, so SR2, SR and SR3. Right, ESSER Where, 1 where's is the care, CARES, CARES. breakdown. ESSER 1 is the CARES. So that would be okay. the first three columns on the spreadsheet. All right, for example, under French benefits, we had 113, almost 114,000. We expended about 87, uh, and we have remaining 26, almost 27 million. Correct. So we have been using that funding. We were using that funding last year. And that's thousand. This year. I'm sorry. That's twenty. That's twenty six thousand seven hundred ninety sixty three. Correct. Correct. Okay. I was off by a few million. I'm sorry. Uh, um, yes. So those are the columns that would be uh, would our ESSER one, but have also been termed CARES money. As, you, as I said before, we have a lot of alphabet soup. Did you add in the, remember we had uh, transferred 2.1 million over from the city's CARES Act money. And then we hit, we paid Boys and Girls Club out of that, but the balance went to it. So does that, is that entered into the SO1? Actually, that is not. I'm gonna make a note and Mel and I will provide you with documentation about that. Okay. We were leaving the money that, that has come directly to the school department on this sheet. So the okay. other funds that were supported from the city, we certainly can provide you with a breakdown on those, but they're not on this. If, if I can just suggest something, this is, and I'm not saying because we did it, but this is what we presented to the city council and, it's a, and, and we can get you a copy. It's a complete breakdown, many columns, we use different colors and I think Bill would tell you as he's sitting next to me, it was very helpful. And on where um, money was spent and where our plan is to spend money. And it was, it, 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 these are, are nice. And I know people put a lot of work into them, but they're just not really like citizen friendly. Sure, and we'd love to, if you it's have something. Yeah, it's just imagine converting the, the it just, I think it's a click of the button, converting it to a different format. That's about it. Yeah. But I think it's just, it's, it's I Maybe understand it because I- but We're happy to do it. Yeah, I understand it because we work with this every day, but when we handed it to the general public, when they asked for this information, it's just so much friendlier to, to hand a document like this uh, versus the one that we use all day, you know, off of Munis. So I've made a note, um, Mayor, that to ask your office for an example of that, and we're happy to look it over and see if we can format this data that we have to be- I, I can leave this one with, with Chris. I'll give it to Wendy. You can just give that one to Chris. Okay, if, go ahead. If, if I may, we'd really appreciate an electronic copy. We do most of our stuff, stuff through the computer, so we will reach out. So Lorraine, I'll ask you to do that. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on, on ESSER 1? Any questions on ESSER funding for anyone? What, what, um, I apologize, but what what's fringe benefits consist of? It consists of 
um, a MTRS um, portion that's um, allotted through the federal government so that that's monies that goes to the state for the teacher retirement. It also then includes city retirement, uh, the portion that we would be pay paying for paras and tutors and anyone who is in an independent contract that is not covered by the teacher um, retirement. And then it includes health benefits for the people who are part of this grant. It's for their salaries. It's not for stipends and extras, but it's for salaries. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I'll, I'll just, Dean, I'll just mention the um, ESSER three, all of that documentation. And again, thank you to Mel and to Greg Chapdelaine and Elliot Nadu. We have all of our capital project um, expense requests into the state. The state has actually had to hire additional people to review these. So eyes are being reviewed at this time and we'll be ready to go as soon as we get the okay on that piece. So all of the monies are in areas. Um, we have a, a large amount from ESSER 3 that are considered capital projects or capital expenses based on the federal government's um, definition. And so we are, we're set to go as soon as we get the green light from the state. Okay. You want to continue on? I, um, I don't, that's, that's all I really have, unless you have some specific questions about things. I can certainly just give a rundown of the large projects if you'd like me to do that. Sure. Okay. So we are looking to purchase five 15 passenger vans to be used around the district for student transportation uh, during school time and for enrichment activities, as well as for use for our um, fine arts programs and our athletic programs. We are looking to, to purchase and install seven self-contained portable classrooms at um, a couple of different sites in the district. Some of them would be replacing, for the most part, they will be replacing portables that we do have that are in disrepair. Um, if we would like more information about that, I'm sure that Elliot um, would come forward and talk about that. Um, we are looking to purchase nine storage units, and these are very specific for nine of our sites. The, um, uh, the materials that we need to use for sanitizing are not allowed in the actual buildings that we have. And there are fire codes that, are, um, that we need to follow. So we're looking to have a storage unit um, at each of nine of our sites to house those materials outside of the school building. Then we are looking to replace um, and well, um, certainly to replace, but actually to enhance the security camera system on our nine through 12 campus. Also looking to maintain and upgrade the HVAC equipment across the district and um, a project to called balancing of the HVAC systems uh, at two of our buildings, the two middle schools. Um, I've learned a little bit more about that than I think I need to, but yes, a lot of HVAC work that we're doing. And as I'd mentioned, the portables also require a large amount of money for teardown and site work to replace those. So those are the major pro projects. Uh, we do have some technology major projects. Again, um, I, I think that that might be for another meeting that we could talk about those specific projects. That, um, there's one in the works now. Uh, I don't know <coughs> if you'd like, I'm sure Steve could speak to that, but I, I can't speak to the technical side of that. Mayor, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, Eileen, those, uh, sorry, Laurie, those projects that you just listed through, are those coming out of ESSER 2? They're mostly out of ESSER 3. Okay. Another large component that we have is the expense for um, academics and instruction. Uh, we have been really working hard to invest in evidence-based programs 
that will accelerate the learning of our students. We're, we're poised to purchase some additional materials, curriculum products that are evidence-based and that will hold us in good stead going forward for the next number of years. So we will be well placed even after this funding has gone to have evidence-based programs in our major content areas, grades K through 12. I can go on and on, but I'm not sure that, that people want me to do that. So um, could, you, could you just up there at the bottom here, you have listed $11,193,495. Did you mean that to be the balance before those items that you just discussed? Or correct. You, you meant that to be before? Correct. So do you have estimates on all of those items that you just discussed what that totals so we can deduct that theoretically as an estimate from the 11 point they're actually million. listed um dean they're actually listed at the bottom next to the descriptions so the passenger vans and all so what, what would be that total i, I didn't bring so if my you look the five passenger board. vans are it's two hundred thousand dollars an estimated two hundred thousand dollars right if, so van. what i'm saying is did somebody add these up so if you would, if you want to look at the, um, let's see, the other line for equipment. So at the right above the eleven million dollar, there yeah, 2. is 6. a two point six. That's equipment, right. and then if you look up into contractual, the contractual for um, school facility repairs and improvements is one point two. So we're looking at approximately two three. $3.8 million, and that's an estimate for those items that I had talked about. So they are the equipment pieces and then the contractual service provider information for school facility repairs and improvements. So again, it's about 3.8 million. So we're deducting approximately, we're not, we, we haven't paid for these yet or even put them out to bid. So you're taking out approximately four million out of the eleven million one hundred ninety-three. Is that correct? Yes. So you're okay. correct. That's not encumbered yet. All right. Everybody get that. I mean, is that pretty much understandable? These are estimates. These aren't etched in stone. The items above here are pretty accurate. Uh, those have been ones they've been using right along, but these others are estimates only. Dean, I added them up and I came to 3,297,000. Okay. So just. I'm sure some will be more, some will be less. They'll average themselves out. And then I think any questions thus far, and then we'll speak a little bit to, um, so your balance then basically after that, if it's 3.2, um, you're in the eight or 9 million range, leaving a buffer of, contingency of 10% based on how things come in mm -hmm. on bid? Yes, so and, the, and all of these are grants. Uh, and so they are handled through the State Department and we have a liaison with the state for each one of these grants. We are allowed to make um, requests for amendments to grants. And so as long as we are amending to change an approved bucket of money, we can amend. So as you said, if we have one of the um, one of the large purchases or one of the large capital expense projects that do go over, then we can go back and look at the budget and see where we might have to do, um, move monies around a little bit. And we have the ability to do that with all three, but all, all three of these ESSER monies. Right. We have a, a large amount that we've put into uh, our professional staff, and uh, that, that's actually an ESSER three, but that can be used starting now and going forward. And those are the conversations that we've been having with Mel regarding additional teachers that we might need, um, tutors that we might need, guidance counselors. We'll put a pitch out for, 
if we could get a couple of nurses, Kathy Gaudet would be very happy and we would hire them right away because we'd have needs for them as far as COVID is concerned. So we do have money there. I had mentioned as well that we have a large amount of money in our curriculum and instruction area. That was a recommendation for those evidence-based programs. And we have funding for um, summer <coughs> programming and for other enrichment activities. We're very, very hopeful that we're gonna be able to have after school and Saturday programming starting in the spring. One of the things that is tying us up is the transportation. So in order to provide this, these opportunities for all of our children, we really need to get um, additional busing to bring them home from the after school programs. And that's an equity thing. So we're ready to go with programming as soon as we can get some transportation. Could, could someone get us a list of the, at this point, there have been things that have been submitted by school departments, sort of, is it okay if we spend money on our ESSER? Our American Rescue Plan funds for this. Some things have been rejected, some not. Can we get a list, the members of the committee of eligible um, areas that we can uh, use this money for? That would help be helpful. Also, yes. what is the what is the statutory, um, I guess, responsibility of the school committee as it relates to the funding? That would be helpful to get everybody a copy of that. And then third is uh, in October, there was an article in the champion um, asking for input on spending federal COVID funds. If we can get a copy of whatever ideas were submitted, that was October 12th, 2021 in the Lemus the Champion. Lemus the Public Schools seek input on spending federal COVID funds. So if we can get some sort of an idea of what some of those suggestions were, because I would assume without knowing what they are, that they're from students and staff and PTOs and parents and custodians maybe. So if we could get those three, I think that would be helpful for our next meeting, which is in, in, uh, for another couple of weeks. Ron, you had a question? Yeah, you know, the, uh, regarding the five, five bands. Yes. Do you know if you're gonna do electrical power now? Ron, you're on mute. His question was, will the vans that we purchase be electric power generated and will they have seatbelts? The answer to the second part, they will definitely have seatbelts. The answer to the first part, while we would very much like to purchase vehicles that are electric, um, right now we're looking for any 15 passenger vans that might become available. I'm sure we all know the issues that the large um, automobile manufacturers are having. So we, right now we've been looking and looking and we have one that's available for us to put a quote in on. So um, yes, Ronnie, we will be happy to do our very best to look for um, electric or hybrid if we have the ability to do that. But the shortages from the auto manufacturers may hinder us from that. Could we use funding to hire, like we have a contract with first student in the interim, if we're not gonna be able to find five buses and we need them to move students around for different activities, couldn't we just contract and pay the extra cost to first student for now until you know, until we locate the, I mean, I don't want to shut programs down. I mean, I think the purpose of the, this funding is to help kids and students catch up. It absolutely is. I think Mel impact. can speak to this because yeah. we have a shortage of buses just to cover our routes now. Right. So Dean, we, um, I actually meet with the bus company every week on Tuesday at noon um, to discuss their staffing issues and um, where, you know, just to get an idea of where they're at. And just this week alone, they were hit just in Lemonster, not including Fitchburg, with four of their uh, bus drivers out with COVID. And that's a lot for them. And they're trying really hard to hire people, but unfortunately they, they get them in and wait for them to get their CDLs. And by the time they get their CDLs, they've decided to go somewhere else. So they're doing the best they can right now. Today, uh, they told me they have five new bus drivers in the pipeline that they're hoping to get in 
and active driving by February 15th. Um, that can change, of course. They thought they were going to have five by, you know, January 15th, but unfortunately, it was down to one by the time everyone got the CDL and passed the test. So, um, so what you had listed here is 515 passenger vans. Yep. Transportation of out of right. school time and in enrichment activities. So yes. I'm assuming that's mostly after school. It does include a lot of our after school programs, and so it also no includes our vocational. So there are no drivers for even after school programs. Well, we can try. Those are different, right? You don't need your CDL license to drive the passenger vans. Mm -hmm. So that might be easier for us as a district to find drivers, you know, who have maybe retired and are looking for just a part time job. Um, unfortunately, the bus company has a lot, a lot more stringent regulations that, you know, they've got to go through <coughs> the process. To get I just hate to see us not be able to offer those programs because that's yeah. the whole purpose of the funding. I is agree. To minimize the impact and try to catch students up. Yeah. So maybe at your next meeting, you can just ask is it possible to hire people, even if we're able to salvage some of the programs after school, if we can't get them during the day, then maybe other drivers are willing to stay later. Um, you know, when their early routes get done to transfer over to the, these other yeah. routes. Yeah, I will, I will certainly bring it up at our next meeting. All right. Other questions? Okay. Right. Adequate. So, um, how much have we spent directly related to learning loss, and how much do we have kind of earmarked for that? I, I, I don't. Yes, I, that, that's a very good question, and I don't have those numbers just right in my head. I will say that we have purchased um, one hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of um, curriculum materials and products. And we have also purchased instructional technology. We had a, a large amount of money from um, what the mayor had mentioned as the City Cares Act and another grant that was for instructional technology even before these grants came into play. So I'm going to make a note, Greg, um, if I may, Mr. Thomas, to, uh, to put together um, some of the bigger items so that I can, can get that to you all. Um, but I don't have that in my walking That's around okay. yet. Um, and then the, the next question I had was, is ESSER 2 FIFO or first in, first out with ESSER 3? Like, do we have to spend the ESSER 2 before? Okay. All right. I don't know where I got that from. No, it, 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 it would be great if we could do that because it's just a whole lot cleaner. But the funds all run from now. Um, one ends next September, one ends the following September, one ends the following. So we're going to do our best to, to finish out ESSER 1 as soon as possible. But we do have large projects in both ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 that were part of our narrative that were approved. So those two are probably going to run consecutively for most of the next year and, and a half or so. All right, because I know that some of the money in ESSER 2 was specifically set aside for learning loss, right? Yes, and we have um, a large amount of money in paraprofessionals and tutors to work during the summer and to work after school, as well as stipends for teachers to do the same thing. And then um, monies for, <coughs> as I, I've been saying forever, uh, evidence-based programming. So um, we have uh, teams at our middle school, our high school, and our elementary school already in place that are um, reviewing and selecting materials for the major content areas. Other questions? Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Lauren. Melanie, other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. And um, I think, Melissa, did you say there are other people trying to get on for the public forum? Yeah, in the chat feature. Mm -hmm. Someone mentioned that they were at home and wanted to be able to participate in public comment and felt they weren't given that opportunity. Okay. Do you have that, Chris? In the chat? I saw Natalie Stassen. I don't know if they're still there. But... Steve, do we have anyone who wants to speak? If anybody wants to, while we're 
discussing other items, just go ahead and put yourself on the chat saying, yes, I'm interested in speaking and we will go back over to you. How's that? Okay. We are now going to move to the approval of the minutes, December 20th, 2021. Has anybody had a chance to review the minutes? If so, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I make a motion to approve the minutes. All right, a motion by Eileen, a second by Ron. Are there any errors or omissions? Anyone wants corrected? If not, all in favor signify in the usual manner. Those opposed? We'll now move on to the January 4th, 2022. Yes. A point of order since Greg is um, virtual. Like, yep. I don't know whether, like I don't see him on my screen, but he's voting. Okay, so if you're at home, Greg, you would have to signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, so is unanimous. We'll now move on. Just one thing. It looks like they spelled uh, Josh's last name wrong. Okay. Uh, under vice chair section there. We'll settle out a quote with you, Josh. <laughs> I got a penny right here. We're going to fix it. We're well, sorry about that. Get that fixed. I, I'm, not as, I'm not as meticulous <laughs> as Mike, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on the second uh, set of approvals, January 4th, 2022, does anybody have, everyone have a chance to review the minutes? If so, can someone make an motion? Yep. And is second. there a second? Was it by Melissa? Who was it by? Oh, Melissa. Brandon? Okay. So it was Melissa and then Brandon on a second. Were there any questions or comments, errors, omissions? If not, all signify in the usual manner. Mr. Gray Aye. is the yay, so it would be unanimous. Okay. Subcommittee reports. I know that there needed to be a vote on the admissions for the policy for the CTEI waived the second reading. And I believe um, Renee and Dan, are they on with us? Yes, they are. Okay. Good evening, we're here. Hi guys. Hi, Dan. Uh, I just wanted to say, I hope you're all enjoying that wonderful space that was renovated by CTEI. Um, it's a beautiful space in that building and uh, just uh, giving our school an attaboy for that great place you're having that meeting, so. That was involved, worth it, Dan, good job. Well, it involved all many, many shops, so electrical, plumbing, carpentry, he, um, HVAC did a little work there, but uh, that was a great project. That's gorgeous. So the policy before you tonight has time sensitivity. We need to submit this to the state prior for Dan opening up any of his programming to um, have students come in. It's very lengthy, as you can see. We have not only the policy, but we put in the procedures as well as, as students transition from our into our VOTEC and within the VOTEC. Uh, Renee and Dan have done a lot of work um, trying to clean this up. There's some grammatical errors. Thank you, Greg Rankowski. Um, <laughs> he's going to be our next Michael. And Christine Silverman will be cleaning any of those up. So if we could waive the second vote so we could submit to the state as soon as possible, we would truly appreciate that. Any questions Renee and Dan can answer though. Okay, any questions at all? So I had a question. Um, so how does this differ from what we're currently doing or is this exactly what we're doing? So it's exactly what we're doing, but now it's on paper. Um, we were very good about our procedures, but having a policy in place, the state is really looking at technical schools right now and making sure that uh, all everything is covered through a policy. So uh, they've just asked us to clean that piece up, make it current to match our procedures. So we're not doing anything different. We just have to submit in a timely fashion. And we're getting ready in February to start our open houses with students and starting selections for coursework. Um, thank you. I read the entire thing and it is lengthy. Yeah, um, but I thought it was very thorough. 
Um, and I just wanted to make sure that it was uh, consistent to what we're it is. currently doing our practice. It is. Any other questions from members? Pretty straightforward. I think it was basically encapsulated everything they were already doing and just putting it in good order and format so everyone can share and it will turn that into electronic version. And then anytime there are new students coming into the system and parents that might be interested or someone has a grievance for some reason, the policy's in place. Yes. Uh, Dan, I know that um, you had a close working relationship with Mr. Tucker Automotive Division up at the high school and he passed away just last week. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Uh, we've lost some very valuable uh, staff and team members of our schools. And I didn't know while I had you on if you wanted to speak specifically to, to Mr. Tucker or anyone else that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Dean. Um, Donnie was a 25 year veteran of our automotive collision repair shop. Um, the, there were two instructors in that program. Right now we've got the job posted looking for a replacement for Donnie. Uh, Alex Scipioni, who was the second instructor in that program was a student of Donnie's. Um, Donnie kind of recruited him into the program. He went through all four years. Donnie helped him get a job out in the field. He worked in the field for about 10 years. And then when Larry Pierce retired uh, many years ago, Donnie recruited Alex to come back and be a teacher. And Alex was a little nervous about it, but he's now been with us for nine years. And he really truly misses Don as does all of CTEI. Don was a, a good voice of reason uh, long time, outstanding member of the program. We're going to really miss him. Our condolences to the family. Um, all of his students went through Lemister High School, two of them, uh, Eric and Michael, both went through the vocational schools and they're doing great uh, on their own now. But uh, I know the family misses him. We miss him. And uh, I appreciate you recognizing him. Thank you very much, Dean. And, uh, God bless him and the family. So thank you very much. I know, Supreme. Thank you. I know. We had a student, the loss of a student, also other staff members over the holiday season. I don't know if you wanted to speak to those. Yes, we, um, we lost a student from LCE who had put up a tremendous fight with a battle of brain cancer. And uh, we were looking forward to him coming back right after the break. And we were, we were told by his doctors, we were preparing for that. We were working with them. So everybody's been quite shocked. Um, he will definitely be missed amongst the community. We have brought in resources to help not only students, but the staff. It's, it's a very tight knit group on LCE side. And this was a loss. And for many of the students, it was the first time they had experienced anything like this. Um, kudos to our staff who all showed up with their students as support systems to the wake and help them process through that. And we are continuing to process through that. So as well, we have had quite a bit of loss this year. And so everyone is trying to move forward and um, just stick together and be a support system. So if I could just ask for a moment of signing, silence, please. Okay, cool. thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Dan. Okay, so uh, do we have a motion? It sounds like everybody's read through this. They're comfortable with it. They understand it. So uh, do we have a motion in a second? Is there a motion by Eileen? And Mr. Perla will be a second. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, all in favor signify in the usual manner. Greg? Yay. All right, we have a unanimous decision. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Great work, Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Appreciate your work on this. Thank you. And then we also have a, a vote. Typically at this time of year, we vote on the overnight field trip. Is Correct. that something we're gonna vote on tonight? Yes. All right. Does everybody pretty much have an understanding of that? No? All right. Let's get an update on that then. Laureen, would you like to give an update? Sure. So uh, at our high school, uh, the stump group, which is a, an extracurricular group that is led by teacher Larissa Murphy, is requesting a trip to Washington, D.C. 
It is taking place during uh, a couple of April vacation days, but it is a school sponsored trip. And it is the purview of the school committee to approve overnight field trips. Um, so this is a field trip by, our, by students from the high school. They are funding it themselves through some fundraising and then their own um, personal funds to travel to Washington, DC. The itinerary, I believe, was part of your plan. <coughs> so this is, um, this is not the eighth grade trip that traditionally happens. We did not, um, we did not plan that trip for this year. I'll make a motion to approve the stump uh, field trip to Washington, DC. I'll second it. No motion and a second. I would make it conditional that our students, when they take a trip to Arlington National Cemetery, that they um, research those lemons, the residents who served our country, that they bring back with them names of those who are buried at Arlington National Cemetery. I will make a note of that. All right. Yes. Craig and then well. Melissa had something as well. Every one of the field trips that we've had so far this year, we have asked for the teachers or administrators who have planned it to provide us with their COVID plan. I don't have a specific one, um, um, Melissa, but I will make sure that we have one and that I put it in the next packet so that you will all be aware of the COVID precautions that will be in place. All right, did somebody else, Greg had a question? And then yeah. Eileen, did you have a question after? Okay. Did we have many students that weren't able to go because they weren't vaccinated or did, did everybody who wanted to go were able to go? I'll have to get that information. I believe that everyone who wanted to go was able to go. So um, I'll make a note of that as well to have that question answered. Okay, Eileen, you had a question? I was just gonna um, add if they're uh, visiting the Vietnam Memorial, they may also wanna see if there's any Lemonster residents and, um, and on there, there are. Well. Yes, they are. There is. I, I'm there sure is. there are, but uh, I just wanted to throw that out there as well. So I'll make a note of that. Thank you, Eileen. All right. So we have a motion to second. All in favor? Signify in the usual manner. Those opposed? Greg? Aye. Okay. And moving right along. We have new and old business. Um, new or old business, I have a couple of things, but if anybody else has anything, just before I forget though, today's announcement by the governor, in case anybody missed it, uh, 26 million eye health COVID-19 indigen rapid tests have been purchased. They'll be distributed to K to 12 schools and childcare facilities to be used five days following those who were in close contact or experiencing symptoms. Beginning this week, schools will be able to sign up to receive at-home kits for, for weekly use by all participating stats, staffs and students. And then schools exercising this option will discontinue contact tracing and test and stay. Schools must uh, continue to participate in symptomatic and or whole testing in order to take part in the new home, new, new home at home test program. Schools will be able to start opting into this program this week for staff and will receive tests during the week of January 24th. Schools will receive tests for students whose families opt in during the week of January 31st. Students and staff who participate will receive one kit every two weeks to test themselves. That's two tests in each kit. And then also the federal government is offering free tests. Right now, as of I think before I got here, the delivery date would be the end of January, beginning of February. So I would suggest everyone get as many kits as they possibly can. We will be a society of kits for a whole long time <laughs> and it will just be a way of life. And um, so anyway, and then one, 
on the thing here. And along that line, I was wondering, is the city still having its um, COVID testing site uh, down by Doyle? We're not. It, it just became, once test one demand, it became too much of a conflict with um, Pre Street School. It, and it, as much as everyone tried to cooperate, it, it, we just couldn't make it work. It took 20 or 30 staff people every day to make it work. So we've combined it with Fitchburg and um, it's at the airport now. And so Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, uh, 12 to four, and we run it on Mondays and Wednesdays and then Fitchburg runs it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it is available. And the one item that I think we took advantage of last year is uh, Mass Life Science is now offering student internships for high school students. That's different. Last year was the first year they just started this program. And um, so this is the second year that they've allowed high school students to participate. So parents, teachers, guidance counselors, friends, family, anyone get the message out. They, uh, they last year recommended we put in for the program, strongly recommended. And to the point where they were wink, wink, nod, nod. If you do, then we'll make sure you get funded. And I would suggest that's probably going to be the, the case this year. So those are my quick two. Oh, not so quick. Anyone else on the new and old business? Brandon? I just uh, have two things. First, uh, I want to say thank you for making this hybrid thing work uh, and everybody who made it work. I had previously asked for this. Uh, when we made the move from our remote meetings back to hybrid. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad it's the income to fruition so people can be at home who want to participate in our meetings. Um, one question I have for you is six o'clock going to be the new time. I've been ask everybody is six work better. It just seems like for families it works better. I know as it gets later and you're trying to corral the little ones and get them fed and get them into that routine of that transition from <laughs> To, you know, throwing peas at each other to, to bedtime and shower time. So if six o'clock works, it works for me. Josh, why are you? Why are you? <laughs> There's Thank you. Peas, peas in every crevice. Trust me, every home. All right, if it works okay, we'll continue on with that. Thank you. Is this format okay? I know if we get a bigger audience, I really thought we were going to be able to space out here and keep our distance, but you know, we ended up with more people. So maybe not at the next meeting or at the next meeting if we have to maybe at the high school if it's more people i don't know but this gives the option of everyone what everybody asks for i got everybody's email mass no mass six feet distance um zoom non-zoom so um this okay with everyone it works okay we'll we'll do this meeting by meeting <laughs> if we have to adapt we will yes um it, it's it, it's just whether or not the school system participates in the program it's a free test and it's 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 really to keep schools open you know the, uh, i didn't hear that wendy did you hear anything no it's just automatic we're just gonna right Anything on this, Mr. Greg? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been to a lot of meetings, but when the when the DESI came down with the mask mandate, they made a couple exceptions for um, behavioral and health reasons. I don't remember the committee ever coming out with a formal policy around that, um, it, or uh, disciplinary action related to that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. But um, what I'd like to discuss is those exceptions and those policies in the next meeting to kind of formalize that if we haven't done that already. So we, we did um, address the issue and we were using it as um, accommodations for children. So whatever child needed accommodation, if that's one of the accommodations, um, that was something that was allowed and permitted. So, Greg, this is old and new business. We weren't going to discuss things on the new and old business. So, did you want an update? Is that what you're requesting? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean for it to okay. turn into a discussion. Just wanted to, just wanted to be um, clear on what you were requesting. Yeah, yeah I just want to take the opportunity next meeting to review these policies if possible. And if it's not formalized in a document or in a student handbook or something, I would like to possibly discuss that. Okay. Yes. Well, he's asking it to be placed on the agenda, and then it would be, it would be, referred to the policy subcommittee. Chris, does that make sense? I mean, all of it. It's basically, requesting: Do we have a formal policy? Is it in writing? What's, What's in the policy? Can we get a copy in advance? Yeah. yeah. Right. Is that that summarize it correctly? Yep. Yeah. So and maybe we're saying it is a to, formal to disseminate policy? it. If so there maybe is one, on the next agenda, she can include the policy. Let's let's get the circulated before the next meeting if there is a policy. Josh? Can I add that's a direct reflection on the policy review? It's easy to call the I'm sorry, the what? Josh, can you unmute yourself, please? You have to unmute yourself. I can't, I can't hear anybody. Thank you. So I was looking to add if we could um, review any policies related to mask breaks. It seems to be school by school. Right. Don't happen. I just, just want to add that to Greg's request if I could. If we could see if there's anything been, that's been worked on so we can tell parents that we have a consistent plan. I, I think one of the. Uh, yeah, Go ahead, so one of the concerns or feedbacks I've heard is um, if there's a consistent discipline policy for people or students, if they're unable to, if they're able to wear masks and are not wearing them. So I think that is a topic to potentially be discussed too or for bringing it up. All right, so we'll get, a, we'll get a copy of the whole policy. So we'll dig through all of that. Any questions that you have, it's always helpful if you get those questions to us so I can get them to the superintendent and she can get them to whoever in advance of the meeting. So I'll have a lot of the answers when we get here and then we'll refer it to the policy committee. All right, hold on. We, we, we can't have discussion from the public once the, the committee's in, in, in session. Yes, Amy? Um, I would just like to add that we did not say our school committee statement um, and just in future meetings, if we can just say that so we um, have our sort of mission statement out there. Correct. Well, somebody took my spot over. <laughs> I only been gone, I've only been gone two weeks and somebody's already taken my spot. I don't know how I feel about that. I have one more thing that I wanted to. <laughs> yes. So, um, there's been a lot of um, communications across some of the districts in Massachusetts about ending contact tracing in the schools. I don't know where that decision making lie. lie. Um, so, but if it's something that needs to come in front of us, I, I'd like to discuss that as well. That's part of what the governor had mentioned in this press release today. So maybe we get a copy and send that out as well. What it says the schools exercising this option will discontinue contact tracing and test and stay. The whole new, you know, stay in school, test, whatever it might be. Is that under the auspices of the Board of Health? I don't know. I'm just reading to you what the governor said today. All the direction comes from the Board of Health. Well, this would be the schools would have to determine whether they're going to discontinue contact tracing and do the test and stay. So it may be, I don't know. I guess we'd have to. Ask legal or ask the, the superintendent has a hand up. Yeah. Uh, Dean, there is an uh, there's a webinar tomorrow at one o'clock with the state and the Department of Ed to discuss just this with all lead nurses. Uh, right now, it looks that we would have to get approval through our local board of health. But once that meeting concludes, I will send the notes out to school committee um, as I do each time. I mean, they've stopped contact tracing for the yes. all purpose. I mean, nobody answers the phone. <laughs> nobody will tell you who they were exposed to. So that, yeah. the whole, it, I'm telling you, it's just going to go to a system where 
everyone's just going to get, you're going somewhere, you're going to get yourself tested. You don't feel so good, right. you're going to get yourself tested. It's just going to be part of our new world. Yeah, this new All testing right. is to alleviate that. So right. that would be it's very- the Perception that we're actually doing contact tracing, which we haven't been doing. Okay, anything else? All right, so we'll continue to meet here unless there's some sort of a urgent change we get feedback, there's gonna be more people attending, but I hope this works out for families and people that weren't able to make it tonight or staff and students that would like to connect with us, but aren't able to. We'll try to clean it up a little better so we, we um, be a little more efficient next time. But Melissa beat, beat me to it, not that I could make the motion, but she has a motion on the floor to uh, adjourn. Is there a second? Josh made a second. If there are no other questions, all in favor of adjourning? Those opposed? Yeah. And <laughs> Greg gives us the thumbs up. He gives us the thumbs up. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.